94 recognized for contributions to country. Prime Minister thanks ADB for continued support and successful Guitar Day held in Port Mosby. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for the news this Queen's birthday public holiday. 94 people have been officially recognized for their contributions to the development of Papua New Guinea. The 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours List announced by Governor General Grand Chief Sebob Darai today includes three new knights and a dame. Dame Nora Vagi Brash has been recognized for services to the community through active promotion of local culture and heritage in her roles as author, playwright and poet. The 2018 Queen's Birthday Honours List, released by Government House today, saw the country welcoming three new knights and a dame. Christopher Charles Abel and Melchior Pesatogolo were made knight bachelors, Sir Christopher for his support of agricultural extension and business, and Sir Mel for services to economic development, particularly in the mining and petroleum sectors, and to the community. So by looking, looking for some sample up. Current Minister for Works, Michael Nali, has been made a commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George, Sir Michael has been recognized for his services to commerce, politics and the community as member of the National Parliament and former Deputy Prime Minister. Mrs. Nora Vagi Brash has also been made a commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. Dame Nora recognized for services to the community through active promotion of local culture and heritage in her roles as author, playwright and poet. Dame Nora is best known for her works such as Which Way Big Man, which still remains popular today. Lucy Bogari, Mike Reynolds, Barry Tan and Lens Minister Justin Chichenko have been made commanders of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. Former Executive Director of PNG Chamber of Mines and Petroleum Gregory Anderson is among 12 that have been made officers of the Most Excellent Order of the British Empire. Popular golf musician Basil Gregg was also recognized for his contribution to the music industry in PNG, with Mr. Gregg awarded Member of the Order of the British Empire. Former radio broadcaster Emil Tenoa is among 34 that have received the British Empire Medal. Three police personnel and ten Defence Force personnel also received recognition in this year's Queen's Birthday Honours List. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has thanked the Asian Development Bank for its continued support in improving infrastructure and service delivery in the country. Mr O'Neill said this while announcing the 3 billion Kina ADB funded reconstruction of the Highlands Highway, which is set to commence in the coming weeks. The Prime Minister brushed aside criticism of the government's borrowing, saying no developed country can survive on its own. He says the country is grateful to its partners like the ADB, given its flexible interest rates, which makes it easy for the government to repay. Only not giving me a plan the interest rate to us. Only giving me a 20, 30 years to buy this loan. But one or two percent interest rate. Suppose you go to BSP and you like borrowing this kind of money, but you paying 14, 15, 16 percent. So me plus how when I walk in this law, lo make him sure also you me he got chance lo one more time to solve lo build him infrastructure inside the country lo him. Moreover, Mr. O'Neill says the ADB funded reconstruction of the Highlands Highway is set, with construction tenders soon to be released. Plenty time you miss a walk him maintenance close to close to where maintenance in us are last long blood time. All same the middle likes delivering strong blood strong blood road strong blood strong blood infrastructure. First stage plan 300 million US dollars only work low working work finish. ADB go pass one time online blue email works department. The major reconstruction will start at Kagamuga in Mount Hagen and finish at Nadzab in Leh. Special prominence will be given to the Kasam Pass and the simple section of the highway. Other sections like the Ramu to Medeng will also be given major reconstruction but will come under the assistance of the World Bank. So I'd like to thank you through the ADB and plan the old Narbla too. Chinese government, Australian government, Orlando, New Zealand, only working plan the good work inside the country. Stanley Over Jr. National MTV News. 
The National Court in Mount Hagen has dismissed the election petition case against Kundiawa Gembog MP William Onglo. Justice Ravunama Auka dismissed the case last Friday based on grounds of incompetence. Justice Auka ruled that the petitioner, Tobias Kulang, failed to plead relevant facts. Justice Auka said the petition by former MP Tobias Kulang was based on errors and omissions during the counting of the 2017 national elections for Kundiawa Gembog seat. Kulang challenged Onglo's election victory, stating that two disputed boxes from Mitnande LLG containing 2,363 votes were not included in the counting. However, Justice Auka ruled that the petitioner did not plead relevant facts to demonstrate that there was proper legal polling at Ward 3 and 6 in the Mitnande LLG. Justice Auka said that there is no guarantee that Kulang will receive majority of the votes from the disputed boxes. He told the parties involved that the court does not determine whether possible scenarios would affect results in an election petition. The National Court ordered the petitioner to pay the cost for the first and second respondents, Onglo and the Electoral Commission, and terminated the petition case. Outside the courthouse, Onglo told his supporters that he will continue the work of the former MP Tobias Kulang and urged his supporters to respect each other. Onglo said he has plans to develop agriculture business in the Kundiawa Gambog area. Man only, Mr. Five Years, next one, time change, so Lula Man Bagamna stuff. Maybe I'm custodian, we will look at the people, your money, your resources, what's that? Lula Man's name, only five years. You know, now we will stop full time. No problem, Mr. Tobias, we don't take you. Five years of Lula Man come. When I'm walking, walking, but we continue to go. And we go out next one, but I'm a normal person. You know, some people cross over the next one. You know, one day, now that God is walking this shit, let's move on. Fasinata Yama, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. You're watching National MTV News stories on the Crocodile Festival of the Sipic River and Port Mosby's Guitar Day to its second year running. Those stories and more when we come back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to National MTV News. The Sipic River Crocodile Festival Organizing Committee recently received 50,000 kina from Papua New Guinea Tourism Promotion Authority. This festival is a major tourist attraction and has seen international visitor attendance increasing every year. marks the 12th year for the Sipik River Crocodile Festival. When presenting a check of 50,000 kina to the festival's organizing committee, Tourism Arts and Culture Minister Emil Tamur said, preserving PNG's cultural and historical values is one of his ministry's primary roles. I'm pleased to announce that uh, through my ministry and in support by the Tourism Promotion Authority Executive um, uh, Officer, Mr. Jerry August, we are, we are able to support this year's um, festival. The chairman of the festival's organizing committee was grateful for the support, saying international tourist numbers were increasing each year particularly with added numbers from Europe and Israel. And we have visitors coming. Last year we had uh, about uh, 60, 72 tourists uh, visiting that uh, festival. Um, tourists come from all over the world. Minister Tamur also added that it was proper for his ministry and PNGTPA to support the Sepik River Crocodile Festival as it was currently the only major cultural festival in the Sepik and Momase region. In festivals all around the country and it uses the festival as one of its major attractions in marketing PNG all around the world. <laughs> The 2018 Sipik River Crocodile Festival will be held in Ambunti, East Sipik Province, in August. 
Lilianzo Perakinea, National, MTV News. A guitar day was held yesterday in an attempt to promote professional musicians and expose upcoming guitar players in the country. In its second year, the show was organized by Irish School of Music, a local private school based in Port Mosby. The show was dedicated to John Warbutt and saw performances from renowned musicians including Wayne Atasoa, Adrian Gadissa, Richard Mogu and more. It was a large turnout as Irish School of Music led the show with performances from many talented and renowned guitar players from around the country. With the guitar being one of the main instruments being played across a cross-section of communities, Guitar Day was organized to expose the talent of potential future guitarists. The aim of the Guitar Day is to promote uh, talent and um, many uh, mu musicians out there are talented but they lack exposure so we want to expose guitar players especially. With this year's second Guitar Day, the Irish School of Music hopes to promote the event to other parts of the country. It also hopes to expose other musical instrument players as well. Irish School of Music is a, a private music school. Uh, this is our seventh year now. And uh, we teach string instruments, uh, plus voice, also brass and the percussion instruments as well. Renowned bass player Richard Mogul, who had toured with legendary PNG band Sanguma, was excited to perform on the day, saying it was time for the new generation of guitarists to take the lead. I think, uh, well, I believe it's, uh, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to showcase what kind of level of skills we got in the country, and yet um, highlight that, you know, probably we can do things better to uh, celebrate musicianship and artistic. And it's not only for music, actually. I think the arts are being uh, greatly overlooked in this country, so probably it's a message that we can send to you know some of our leaders that uh, we need to get behind you know things that uh, that embody the youth and, and church and you know all these things that that we occupy them with you know things that uh, they can actually attain skills and uh, some certain level of discipline. Mogu says the level of guitarists in the country has improved with access to internet with younger guitarists fine-tuning skills technique through online tutorials. Usually we've seen singing on, on TV, okay, there's a, there's a, you know, it's made available to the wider audience, but I believe we can experience the, the spirit of music and, and the, the freedom and the, you know, the good vibes that it generates and I believe it should be brought on a stage where everybody can um, you know, enjoy. Probably nowadays we're, we are producing music that's only for the nightclub and probably for the, you know, that kind of audience. But I believe music should be for everybody from the little ones right up to you know, the old. That's how we used to have it uh, traditionally in our communities. Mogu, who will soon be opening a music school in Leh, has stressed that music should be produced for everyone to enjoy. Stacey Yalo, National MTV News. The once famous Moitaka show, normally hosted during the Queen's Birthday Long Weekend in Port Moresby, is now only a memory. Similar to the annual Lei and Goroko shows, the Moitaka show was famous for its display of wildlife and theatre performances. The Moitaka show was an interesting event. Most people who lived in Port Moresby since the 1980s always look forward to every year. It was one of the first shows in the history of Papua New Guinea, which attracted an estimated 3,000 people from all over the country. Lina Wunum, a longtime resident, says a best memory was the bull riding competition. During the Queen's birthday, uh, it was very interesting, but the main event of the show was the traditional dances, which we are now missing at this time. There was uh, it's, uh, the rodeo, 
where people got on the um, cows and then they rode and then they were kicked off by the cows, which was very interesting. And but as the show became popular over the years, so did criminal activities. And finally, in 1997, authorities decided to end the show and the showground developed into a farm. This used to be the showground. It has been 11 years since the last Moitaka show was hosted here. For those who have attended the show in the 1980s and 1990s, say the show was a prestigious event which has brought together business houses and those in the agriculture and livestock sector to showcase some of their products and produce. We, we, were, we are always ready for that event. When that event comes, you know, like we save some money for that event and we enjoy ourselves with our children. It's four days or so. Uh, going to the show and back to the house and you know it's annually so like we all enjoy ourselves but when it comes to the time that uh, the show was uh, stopped somehow it was stopped like everyone you know like forgot all about the show. Tekla Gunga National MTV News. Last Friday, De La Salle Secondary School Song Competition continued. The competition saw students' groups battling through with voices, lyrics and music. What started with 22 teams was left with 10 after the first round. The winning group will have their song sung as the official school song for generations to come. Following the first audition last month, Friday saw 10 student teams battling it out before their peers, teachers and a panel of judges. School principal brother Anthony Swani said he admired the way the songs were presented, which also saw a change in the students' behaviors. Very good in singing and it's no good for us without uh, having a song for our school. So the old school decided to have a school song. The school song, we wanted to have it from the student, not inviting outside people to give us a song. The boys already, they told me that we will come up with a good song that would be the good school song for us. After Friday's audition, five teams will be selected to progress into audition three. Selected ten. Today, the, all those selected ten classes participated. They performed very, very well. So now that we got four judges, they will judge and they select only five songs. So five classes will be selected, then we will have a committee. Then the committee will look at the song lyrics. After that, the committee will give back to them, give them some time to prepare. Then we will have a third audition that the five classes will be performing. Panel judge Leroy Chung was very impressed with the songs and said it was getting tougher to choose which teams would make it through to the top five. For especially the students who came up to present their songs, um, we, we were actually we're actually looking for um, the the kind of song that can relate to the you know the audience and uh, also the criteria of the the school or the competition is you have to to sing about um, the vision the mission and then the statement Audition 3 will commence in two weeks. Winners for the song competition will win cash prizes and also leave a legacy in the school's history, with the winning song to be the official school song for years to come. Lillian Soperakinea, National MTV News. Finally, a student said the UPNG's medical faculty have raised concerns that an alarming number of our population are not aware of their health status. Supporting the cause today, the MedVac students conducted a voluntary medical checkup station at the Vision City Mega Mall here in Port Mosby. Final year MedVac students were pleased at the number of people who voluntarily stood in line for general medical checkups today at Vision City. On the contrary, this is not a regular site at the Port Moresby General Hospital on any given day. 
Bonnie Samoff is a final year student who has been training to become a doctor at the Putmosby General Hospital. He says in their experience, not many people voluntarily check up on their health status until they fall ill. Simple checks like this help people to get to know their status so they know where they are and then when the time comes they can like, you know, think, oh, know, I gotta go now, I can't wait, like I've been thinking of waiting up for something, some way out. Some of believes that tackling the issue is key to reducing the number of basic health issues the country continues to suffer. We don't really have as much man in the way of manpower and facilities, but the ideal thing would happen is that people coming for checkups as regularly as they can, like uh, like a general checkup at least once every six months or so on, just to see where they are, whether they put on a bit too much weight or whether their blood pressure problems is like, so blood pressure is starting to get too high or something, these things can develop over the course of your life. If you're not Running parallel to the medical checkups today was a fundraising sale of printed t-shirts to support the cause of popular lifestyle diseases. The money raised today will be used to purchase basic equipments for the hospital to assist patients who suffer from lifestyle diseases in particular. It has been an annual tradition for final year students to pick a cause and raise funds to give back to the Port Moresby General Hospital. Melissa Gaviro, National MTV News. This is Monday's news. We go for a break now. When we come back, we take a look at stories making headlines overseas. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, getting to the historic summit between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un has taken time, diplomacy, patience and even some name-calling. Here's a look at the on-again, off-again relationship leading up to Tuesday's meeting. As the US was celebrating its Independence Day in July last year, North Korea conducted its first successful test of an intercontinental ballistic missile. Pyongyang claimed the Hwasong-14 could reach, quote, anywhere in the world. In August, US President Donald Trump issuing his most stern warning yet to North Korea. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. In September, North Korea conducted a sixth nuclear test. North Korean television showing pictures of Kim Jong-un inspecting what it said was a hydrogen bomb ready to sit on top of an ICBM. The new year began with Trump ridiculing Kim Jong-un on Twitter. He warned Kim that he also had a nuclear button and that the US button was bigger and more powerful. But just a few days later, the White House issued a statement indicating a willingness to hold talks with North Korea. In February, North Korea sent 22 athletes to compete in five sports at the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics, the two Koreas marching together at the opening ceremony. In March, President Trump accepted that invitation to talks with Kim Jong-un. And in April, the U.S. president revealed a secret Easter weekend trip to Pyongyang by the then CIA director Mike Pompeo. Pompeo held talks with Kim Jong-un about North Korea's nuclear program. Two days later, North Korea announced it had suspended all missile tests and that it was shutting down a nuclear test site. April ended with a memorable handshake in the demilitarized zone between Kim Jong-un and South Korean President Moon Jae-in settling an optimistic tone for future relations on the peninsula. May saw the release of three U.S. prisoners by North Korea as the newly appointed U.S. Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, made a second visit to Pyongyang. President Trump then announcing a summit with Kim Jong-un would take place in Singapore on June 12, announcing it via Twitter. But things took a wrong turn when U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton mentioned the Libya model as a possible blueprint for North Korean nuclear disarmament. Despite an eight-year gap between the Libyan nuclear disarmament process and the downfall of the country's former leader, Muammar Gaddafi, sure. North Korea didn't seem to appreciate Bolton's comments or Vice President Mike Pence's subsequent explanation. This will only end like the Libyan model ended if Kim Jong-un doesn't make a deal. Some people saw that as a threat. Well, I, I think it's more of a fact. A high-ranking North Korean official called the comparison between Libya and North Korea ignorant and stupid, 
and labelled the US Vice President a political dummy. US President Donald Trump sent a letter to Kim Jong-un cancelling the Singapore summit but leaving the door open for possible future talks. At the time, CNN's Will Ripley was in North Korea to witness what Pyongyang describes as the destruction of its Pyongri nuclear test site. He broke the news of President Trump's announcement to his North Korean handlers. Very tense moments, a state of shock amongst not only the journalists, but the North Koreans uh, that the summit that the whole North Korean nuclear test site destruction was supposed to lead up to had now been cancelled. In a surprising response, North Korea responded to Trump's bombshell move without insult or bluster. In response to the crisis, South Korea's president agreed to a request from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that the two meet. Afterwards, Moon telling reporters that both sides were committed to moving forward. As discussions continued behind the scenes, President Trump indicated a willingness to get back on track for Singapore. Everybody plays games, you know that. And then on June the 1st, North Korea's top diplomat and former spy master Kim Yong-chol visited the White House, carrying a letter from Kim Jong-un for President Trump. Afterwards, President Trump announcing the Singapore summit was back on. The widow of All Black great John Olomo says she can finally start grieving now that an important tribute to him is complete. Dozens joined Nadine Lomo and her two young sons at the gravesite, unveiling his headstone in Auckland. A headstone draped in tapa, balloons and music. The scene set for one final farewell. Hallelujah. Tears flowed along with tributes. Son Braley overcome with emotion. The fallen All Blacks brother John Lomu acknowledging his absent mother Hippy who couldn't attend. <laughs> then it was time. Revealing an enduring tribute to the rugby talent's love of sport, his family and his parents. It's something I wanted done a while ago. It was always something that I wanted done. For us uh, as Polynesians, I think it's, it's the final thing that you need to have done. And it's now done, so, you know, we're happy. Fantastic. It, it's Jonah. Flamboyant, wants to show, you know, a bit showy. Today's coming together also a sign that divisions in the family are easing. It's closure for us that um, things are finished and that's pretty much, yeah, and then that's when we can start to mend things up and, and heal. For Nadine Lomu, the unveiling signals the end of a long and difficult journey. I haven't had a chance to grieve, so I think for me now that this is done, I will now be able to grieve. It's the final send-off, you know, when you unveil a stone, it's the last physical thing you do for your, your, your people who have passed on, so it's a closure for everyone, hopefully. A symbol for many gathered here today that the big man is finally resting in peace. And to take us to Chukai Sports, the Football World Cup gets underway in Russia this week, with the hosts going all out on a charm offensive, including lessons on smiling. After a recent string of diplomatic controversies, Russia is looking to boost its image. At the Russian Railways Training Center, they're studying hard. Today's lesson is how to smile. You see, Russians don't do much of that in public. But with more than a million foreign football fans heading here for the World Cup, Russia's keen to make a good impression. Russian people usually don't smile. That's why when other people come to Russia, they think that Russian people are not friendly. We need to teach them how to smile. We need to change their attitude. He's doing well. <laughs> Look at his teeth, cries the teacher. They're shining. But beware. In Russia, smiling in public can get you into trouble. I got stopped by a policeman and I was quite angry about it and he asked me to show my ID. Afterwards I asked him why did he stop me and he said to me, because you were smiling. That's what he said literally, because it is strange, just a person walk on the street and smile. It looked uh, alien and suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of suspicious, here are some Russians who are bucking the trend. This is laughter yoga. It gives me joy, energy, 
uh, energy of that everything is possible and I can do everything. <laughs> it's highly infectious, but a little bit scary. It just goes to show that despite their frosty exterior, Russians have what it takes to put a smile on your face. You're with National MTV News. We go for a break now. When we come back, some sporting updates. Intrukai Sports. Stay tuned. Intrukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. We begin with Rugby Union and 44 teams are competing in the NCD Rugby Union competition in Port Moresby and Royals are running first on the NCD RU ladder at the moment. The NCD Rugby Union competition began in May with participating teams from as far as Goldie River in the Kairukuhiwi district. It is one of the two union competitions being played in Potmos B with teams from male and female divisions. Teams in uh, five different uh, divisions. We have the elite, the A grades, the women's, and the, uh, the B grade. And also. Tony Charlie, an NCD RU executive, says the competition shows the growing interest in union. Leading the ladder in the men's premier division are the Royals, a team representing the Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary. Uh, all the teams from the two disciplinary forces that are taking place, uh, taking part in this competition are Goldie, ATW, uh, Taroma and the guys from Maribarics. And that's also including the Royals team. Which the lead is a positive sign for Royals after the entire team was suspended in 1998 on disciplinary grounds. In the, uh, in the Premier, Premier Division, we have uh, our strong team, uh, uh, Royals. Royals have been good this year. They've, they've come out and really come strong. Uh, one of the strongest teams is the reigning Premier's patterns, of course, uh, defence and the new team, Greyhounds of uh, Tokarara. This match in a great division between Royals and Central Islanders, so Royals proved too strong, coming out victorious with a 17-0 win over Central Islanders. This is the first time the A-grade Royals have won a game after a number of continuous draws in the last four rounds. Thekla Gunga, National MTV Sports. To karate now, and a spectacular performance by Lay's Three Mile Karate Club, who took out the honours at the 5th Provincial Karate Championships, which ended today in Lay. The small club took out 14 gold medals ahead of their nearest rival, Ram Shotokan Karate Club and Lahi Shioto Ryu Karate Club. The championships is a lead-up to overseas tournaments, which will be held throughout the rest of the year. Karate development in Morbe has been on a consistent path over the last six years. Junior development has been the main focus. And this fifth provincial championships held by the Morbe Karate Association is a platform for that development. In the female full contact fight, the skill came to the fore as Morbe representative fighter Jacqueline Barney from Ram Shotoken took on her opponent and won the match. In the men's full contact, Lahi Shito Ryu went up against Ram both equally matched until crucial errors put Lahi out of the competition. Suari Matios from Three Mile was perhaps the star of the full contact fights this afternoon, earlier taking on his Port Mosby opponent, then proceeding to the finals against Kennedy Kinga. Karate in Morobe still struggles with the lack of sponsorship, but with the consistency of competitions, it's been very encouraging for the PNG Karate Federation. We need the outside uh, province, local municipality, so that they can build them up uh, a quality blong on Morobe, because Morobe will fight all yet, all several all yet. But some outside province come, and we will have all mistakes, we will have all kind of On behalf of the Federation, uh, the President 
Senzekal and myself, we are quite happy with the development of Morabe in promoting karate. Scott Wade, National MTV Sports, Lee. To rugby league now in the Northwest Port Mosby National Schools rugby league competition was into its second week at Gerhu Primary School on the weekend. Match coordinators were not just watching the games but were keeping an eye out to scout talent for an NCD team in the upcoming Southern Region Tournament. The second weekend of the school's rugby league in the Northwest saw June Valley Primary School girls leading the ladder in the Open Division. The St. John's Primary School boys have come out strong to secure the first place in the under-14 boys ladder with Waigani Primary School leading the way in the under-16 boys competition. June Valley Primary School is also sitting comfortably at the top spot in the under-18 boys division. Despite the lack of resources, the competition at Garu continues as students' interest in the games have convinced teachers to be at the field on the weekends to coordinate. Coordinators Mr. Sosori and Mr. Oso have been watching the games closely to look out for outstanding players to make up an NCD team for the upcoming Southern Region competition, which is also a selection competition for a tournament at the end of the year in Sydney, Australia. The coordinators are now calling on teachers of the 11 participating schools in the Northwest to come to the field on the weekends to provide supervision of their students. <laughs> Since the start of the competition, the games have been organized from two kina match fees collected. The field is also in a bad state. There are no proper lines. The goal posts are constructed out of bamboo stems and kicking tees and cones aren't provided. The coordinators are calling on the organizers at the PNG RFL to provide proper resources for school games. The National Rugby League body have to come down to this level of us grassroots from the base level to improve the playing standard. The standard of the field is very low. As you can see, our goalposts are bamboos. It's not uh, required. We are in the city and we should be up there. So it's also a negative, you know, part in us teachers, but, you know, we are trying to make do with whatever little means and, and ways that we can uh, get this uh, field organized. And Stacy Yalo, National MTV Sports. Don't go anywhere, we'll have more of Trukai Sports after these messages. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports to Tennis Now, and Rafael Nadal has continued his absolute domination in the French Tennis Open, winning the Grand Slam for a staggering 11th time. The only concern for the 32-year-old Spaniard was an injury scare as he continued his love affair with Roland Garros. If the King of Clay was going to be dethroned at his Parisian palace, Austrian upstart Dominic Thiem was a genuine chance, given he was the last player to beat Rafael Nadal in Madrid of all places. Unbelievable. But 13 years after winning his first French Open, the world number one reigned again. On the surface, he's made his own. Incredibly, Nadal had won 85 of his 87 matches at Roland Garros, going into today's final. And while Tim chased everything, that was never going to be enough to upset the Spaniard. Now he starts to feel very confident. Two sets up, then drama, with the defending champion serving arm. Sorry, I, I cannot move. <laughs> Cramp was diagnosed, and after treatment, Nadal wanted an early closure. But Tim hung tough, saving three championship points before the inevitable straight sets victory. His 11th French title in 14 attempts. Yeah, much. Best ever on this surface, no doubt about it. Rafa's name inscribed yet again on the trophy that was presented by 83-year-old Ken Rosewall, 50 years after the Australian won his second French Open title. Uh, it's amazing. No, I can't uh, describe my, my feelings because uh, even it's not even a dream. His 11th chomp on the Paris silverware, his 17th Grand Slam title, taking him within three of Roger Federer and pushing his career prize money to over 100 million US dollars. 
To international football and there's growing unrest in the New Zealand football community after comments from Football Ferns coach suggests his team can't match against higher ranked nations in the women's game. The Ferns lost 3-1 to Japan in Wellington in front of the biggest home crowd in their history but employed a full defensive tactic much to the dismay of many. Dire, appalling, disgraceful. All words used to describe the overly defensive approach instilled by football ferns coach Andreas Haraf in their friendly against Japan. Well, because they're sitting so deep, they have no room for error. Throughout the match, the ferns used a 5-4-1 formation, really looking to attack, winning just 27% of possession. Their only goal coming from a set piece and a goal mouth scramble. Post-match, Haraf was happy with their performance, saying they'll never have the quality to compete with Japan, despite drawing with them twice before. To say that you just never compete against the world's best, I mean, that's just, yeah, disappointing and, and a bit ridiculous, to be honest. Certainly I know that a lot of football ferns are embarrassed, essentially, by, um, by the strategy. It's not something we wanted to be remembered for. The game was played in front of a home record more than 7,000 fans, but most left disappointed. One of the comments I was... As I was walking away from the stadium last night, I heard a little boy running past me and saying, that was boring, I'm never going to go um, and watch a game anymore. How many of the 7,000 are going to come back for a negative performance like that? Haraf is also NZF's technical director, overseeing every team's style of play. Leaving plenty of concern, others will follow former captain Abby Ersig in retiring. I'm afraid that players will start to walk away from it and, and that's um, quite... I guess concerning uh, we don't have the debts in New Zealand. While for some, questions are being asked around CEO Andy Martin. It starts to put question marks on how the appointments are made. Uh, we've got the director of football, who's now running the football firms. Despite the queries being raised, no New Zealand football bosses were available for comment, leaving more fans and followers wondering what is going on. And finally, in sports, just what heavyweight boxing needs, the return of former multiple world title holder Tyson Fury two and a half years after walking away from the sport. A kiss marked the self-proclaimed Gypsy King's comeback in Manchester against a hopelessly mismatched cruiserweight, Sefa Safiri. A ruckus in the 15,000 strong crowd did pique Fury's interest before he eventually overpowered his opponent. Because all I do is win, 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 no matter what. And that's it. Listen, they're all bums anyway. Wilder, Joshua Parker, whoever else. Oh, 29-year-old Sherman plans to make up for lost time by fighting again in Belfast as soon as August. And that's it for Trukai Sports. Up next, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Stay tuned. Trukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Fine and windy in Daru, mostly fine for Port Mosby and Kerama. Evening showers for Alotau. Evening showers as well expected in Popendeta. To the Momasi region, mostly fine for Leh. Cloudy weather expected in Medang and Wewak. Cloudy becoming fine for Wau, mostly fine in Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, cloudy in Kimbe. A few showers expected in Larangau, Kewe, Kokopo and Rabaul. A few showers as well expected for Buka. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kondiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all these major centres can expect showers and morning fog. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And before we go, a recap of our top stories this evening. 94 recognised for contributions to Papua New Guinea. Prime Minister thanks ADB for support for Highlands Highway and Guitar Day, a successful second staging. And that's the new sport and weather for today. Queen's birthday, Monday the 11th of June 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team from around the country, present viewing, good night.